phones are in Vibrate. Oh, I'm sure I didn't put it in my desk. I got to get on my own here because it's my backup. Hi, Hi, how are you? Our guest today is a Forbes featured keynote speaker on an Amazon Prime documentary series called The Social Movement and the host of one of the top 100 podcasts, Human 2.0. In total, his content has been viewed over 50 million times. However, to reach this level of success, he's had to overcome social anxiety and health issues. We're excited to talk to Mark Metry today as he shares his story and tells us how to screw being shy. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Aaron, Michelle, thank you guys for having me so much. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, so Mark, let's get started by just having you tell us a little bit about your background and the struggles that you have faced growing up. Yeah. So, you know, I think obviously everyone faces struggles, but personally for me, when I kind of look back at my life as kind of the, the main cards that I was dealt, my parents immigrated from Egypt to America, East Coast, Boston, a year before I was born. They came to this country with hardly any money, didn't really speak English. Uh, and so we definitely lived kind of like a hustling immigrant lifestyle of like moving to like dozens of apartment buildings and mm -hmm. never really seeing my parents because they were always at work. Uh, so that was a struggle. But I just kind of remember my childhood just being very simple. It wasn't that bad. And as I got older, one of the events that really, really impacted my life was we ended up moving to a small town outside of kind of the inner city where we had been living that had like 5,000 people in it. And the really interesting part about this small town was, of course, there were a lot of nice people, but there was very, very little like racial diversity. Mm -hmm. And also at this time in America, this was like post 9-11. So if you were Middle Eastern, if you kind of looked a little bit brown, mm -hmm. then, you know, all sorts of like racial profiling and discrimination right. and people calling you like, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a leader of Osama bin Laden, a terrorist, oh, this, this and that. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I remember being a young kid and just being put in this environment where nobody physically looked like me mm -hmm. and people just started to beat the crap out of me and be mm -hmm. super racist and so that for me was, was a real moment that I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a real moment where I almost kind of felt like my brain was putting me in this mentality of just like, everyone in the world hates you. Mm -hmm. Everyone is out to get you. Like a victim You're, mentality. Yeah. Victim mentality. And then also, you know, it was quite very literal in the sense of like, every time that I would walk into a classroom walk through the hallways, just any kind of environment, my brain would just repeatedly tell me those thoughts. And it would tell mm. me to just not talk, put my like, look down, yeah. don't make eye contact with anyone, don't walk around. And so that was, that basically was the real essence of my life for about a decade until I was like 18 years old. And then I began to find out that, oh, this is called social anxiety. And that like, was a mm -hmm. whole rabbit hole. But that for me was like a big, big one that impacted me forever. But you had kind of programmed your brain by that time, right. subconsciously, by repeating those things to yourself. By the time you're 18, you're going to have this whole storyline in your subconscious telling you that, you know, you're not good enough or you don't look the right way or, or whatever it is that the storyline that you told yourself is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember like when I was 18 years old and I was uh, obese, socially isolating myself, depressed and suicidal. I remember I used to go on these walks at night in like the really terrible uh, neighborhoods in Boston because I would like fantasize about someone just trying to kill me because mm. I was in just a lot of mental pain. Yeah. And I remember one of the realizations that I got that began to slowly get me out of that was realizing that the thoughts in my brain were actually mine. Mm. My brain had picked them up from when I was growing up from the kids around me, teachers, other people that just abused me, mistreated me. And then also I know now with kind of like a little bit of my <laughs> like pop scientific background, <laughs> I know now that, you know, your brain is this survival organ that yeah. is constantly collecting data around you. And there's mm -hmm. a high value on negative information because mm -hmm. it can help keep you alive. And so your brain will go throughout your life, especially if you haven't trained it, and it'll just go around picking up these negative thoughts, ideas, and then it'll begin to tell them as if they're yours. And right. so I remember just like walking around and being like, 
having all these thoughts thinking that I was so messed up, but it was a real liberator to be able to realize what you just said, Michelle. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's interesting. So that's really powerful, actually, for, yeah. for people to realize that a lot of thoughts that you have, mostly that have been programmed into your subconscious, they're not your own. It's what's been fed to you from either media, family, bad experiences like you just described. So you went through this mental struggle, but eventually around 2016, you set out on a journey to create the 2.0 version of yourself. You realized that you wanted to be healthier mentally and you wanted to go down a different path than where you saw yourself going. So let's talk a little bit about the 2.0 journey. Yeah, for sure. So I remember kind of when I was going through the whole time that I talked to you guys about, about being suicidal. I, at that time, I had no idea what the words like mental health, happiness, positivity, mindset, I, I didn't even know that these things were, were real. And so I remember, I remember coming back from, from one of those nights walking around my city and I remember I had began to realize what I was actually doing. Because in that time, I was kind of in this trance where you just get caught up in behavior, but you don't actually realize it. Mm -hmm. And so I remember coming back one of those nights and realizing what I was doing. And I remember just looking at myself in the mirror. And I remember at that time, again, I didn't know what any of these deeper things were. I could just see the surface. I could just see physical reality. And so I remember seeing myself being overweight. And I was like, you know, who was I? And, you know, previously up to that moment, I had gained maybe about like 75 pounds in the course of like a month and a half, two months. Oh, wow. And so there was like a very physical change, even though I didn't realize it was happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I came back one of those nights, that was sort of a shift in my perspective where I was like, whoa, things have changed. Who am I? And when I saw myself in the mirror, that was like the first domino effect of beginning to realize I had just gone through something and I need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so I remember just going on Google and just <laughs> going on this journey of like, how do I lose weight? How do I, how, what diet should I follow? And I remember just being led down this massive rabbit hole of all these different diets. Oh yeah, there's oh, yeah. Diets. every way you can think of. It's a dangerous search. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I was so much more confused than I oh, had yeah. even gotten. Yeah. In. Should I eat meat? Terrible. Should I not eat meat? Do, how many vegetables should I eat? Or maybe we're just talking about that. Yeah, we were actually talking about this on the drive to the studio, <laughs> which is really funny that yeah. you're, kind of yeah. talking about it now but it is a rabbit hole for sure yeah of course and then when you look at it i mean of course there are good companies and good organizations but you know the health and wellness industry is a multi-billion dollar industry that affects everyone so there's a lot of there's a lot of power when it comes to uh, how companies market and whatnot right. and, and what leverage they have but yeah i remember going on that journey and that just confused me even more and it wasn't until I just kind of found this, this, uh, this diet health philosophy regimen called Bulletproof. Okay. And uh, that's really where things begin to change. And all that is, is just trying to eat just like natural foods, uh, trying to avoid a lot of artificial right. chemicals, processed ingredients, sugar, things like that. And so, so it's basically like rocket science. We could have never <laughs> guessed that we should just eat healthy, unprocessed foods. This is groundbreaking right here. <laughs> I mean, I wish I would have told like the 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 thirteen year old version of myself who used to eat yeah. who used to eat cake and cookies for breakfast. That all right. Day. Well, <laughs> I am thirty seven and I do that, so I <laughs> I need a better health regimen. <laughs> um, <can> help me. <laughs> yeah, no, but it but it was really just like that that led me to eventually not only lose the weight, but really what that enabled me to do was you know I had never eaten healthy like ever throughout my entire life. I had never exercised regularly. Mm -hmm. I had never slept regularly my entire life. I had always been staying up all night and just doing all these crazy things. Mm -hmm. And so when I began to get my food right, I kind of felt like my brain turned on mm -hmm. for the first time in my life. And that gave me the ability to just gain clarity and it gave me energy. And so once I had more energy, then I just began to, to do you know, various things. And, you know, I could go into like 10 other rabbit holes <laughs> that I <laughs> fell into. But, but yeah, that was definitely the start of my journey. And then, you know, as I began to just know more of myself, then I, then you begin to figure out like, okay, here's how I position myself better in the world. 
then you like start a business and then you start a podcast, and then you write yeah. a book and then people start yeah. to notice you and you, you know, you begin to have like a voice in a platform. So mm -hmm. what do you think kind of like sparked to you to look in the mirror that first, that day where mm -hmm. you kind of realized that you wanted to make a change? Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. You know, the simple answer is I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, um, that's all right. Right. Yeah. Like it, it was a, it was a crazy night. But something but clicked. I, I definitely think it, something clicked. I think maybe one was just being super desperate, mm. like just being in this point where just the fact that I would do this. I think number two was, I remember on that night when I was on a walk, I remember I was walking and I, I felt a moment of silence. Like I remember just stopping what I was doing. Mm. I wasn't listening to music on my phone. There were no cars in the street. There was nobody. And I, I heard, I felt silence. And it was just a really eerie moment where it literally just felt like it was me like me in the world and i i i personally believe that when that happened i felt like that was one of the first times where i really got silent in my own head and i stopped you know being distracted i stopped kind of looking at the opinions uh, of others and i personally feel like you know there's like there's like a true real version of us that mm -hmm. always starts off in the world we are born in and then as we go through the world we learn all this crap yep. explicitly or implicitly and then we just stack that stuff on our true self and then you are like a young adult you're in your 20s whatever and then you you feel like you don't really know yourself you don't really recognize yourself and i kind of felt like that was the moment that i was in and so i felt like on that night I reached a moment of silence where the real uh, truthful version of myself just began to like, I began to even realize that he was there. And I don't think I like heard like a sentence, like an audible sentence, no. right. but I, but I just felt like this feeling that just kind of gave me faith. It just kind of gave me hope that wow. there was just something better. And so it is very much like a, it's, it's a, it's a moment that I have trouble talking about because it's mm. not black and white, it's but it's not definitely tangible. like yeah. one of those. It's a spiritual yeah. experience. I mean, yeah. it sounds like a very spiritual experience and those are hard to explain and, and it does build your faith. And those are the moments that I believe truly shift our foundations. Like you said, those moments have the power to change us in a way that a million diet programs don't. Like right. a shift in your thinking, in your brain, in your spirituality, in your faith, that true, true center that we have. When we have those experiences, true and lasting change happens, I believe. True. Have you guys ever had a moment like that yourself? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because right now I'm on like a my own spiritual journey. <laughs> I'm getting into a lot of different things, um, trying to explore that. So definitely, I think like walks are a big one too, because you're yeah. kind of like out in nature and out in the elements. So yeah, definitely for me and Michelle, you're, yeah. yeah. Anytime I think you find yourself still and silent, I thought it was very interesting that you were saying that yes. you just experienced silence. Because for me, through meditation or just sitting literally still in silence, it's so hard for us to do. And I yeah. think when we do that and we get alone with ourselves, mm -hmm. when we get alone with ourselves, it, you hear things, like you said, you didn't hear a tangible voice, but you heard it anyway. Like there's just, you heard your own voice. Yeah. yeah you just yeah. can't describe it, but you have to be like silent to hear it. it, it it's, if you've, if you've experienced it, you know, but I've definitely have had, had those um, on my own. And I will tell you this, some people might think that it, it's crazy or whatever, but <laughs> one don't. of the experiences <laughs> that I had was I was outside and like, I'll go outside and look at the sky a lot when it's like clear and we can see the stars. And I have a moment, like I, if you listen to the podcast or you know me, like I have a deep Christian belief and I believe in God and I go out and pray and just, you know, whatever. And I was out one night and I, I don't remember exactly what I was asking for or, or thinking about, but I was thinking about something very specific. And I was looking up at the sky and I was like, God, if you would just give me some kind of a sign. This is where people might think I'm crazy, but literally the second my brain thought that right in front of me was a shooting star and oh, not just like cool. a little shooting star that was like, bloop, like it was there for like, it was streaming across the sky. And for a second, I was like, am I imagining? I thought I was crazy. I was like, <laughs> what? And anybody can say, well, that's just a coincidence. There's shooting stars all the time. You were looking at the sky, whatever. 
But if you understand spirituality and you understand these types of things, like I don't believe in coincidences. And for me to be thinking and asking so specifically for something and for it to appear like at that second. So for me, yeah. that was a big turning point in, in my life and my decisions. That's awesome. And I, I feel like the, I think for me, at least like the main commonality in a lot of these other experiences that I've also heard from other people is like, once you experience something like that, everything that you thought about the world, you're mm -hmm. like, wait, what? Like yeah, everything right. goes out the window, every model you had of how things were. Yeah. And then it leads to that point of like, I literally can't keep living the yep. same life that I've always lived because I know this is out there. And I yeah. know that I heard this quote and it was like, um, okay, I don't actually remember the words, but I'm going to try right. to reiterate the meaning. And it was yeah. basically like knowledge without, or no, knowledge with ignorance or like without application is torture. Mm -hmm. And like, it leads me to think like, there are a lot of people who may not have like mind blowing spiritual experiences, but there are a lot of people who may experience something similar to that. Mm -hmm. But yet they're extremely, you know, in a non judgmental way, they're extremely stubborn and yeah. they don't change their ways. And then mm -hmm. I feel like that's why a lot of people have uh, a lot of uh, anxiety and mm -hmm. angst beneath the surface because they know things could be different, but they're just trying to ignore what's in their face. Right. It's an interesting thing. Yeah, I could. It's easy to ignore when things happen or just to brush it off like coincidence. I could just have easily have stood out there and been like, oh, shooting star, that's nice. So where's right. my sign? <laughs> right. why, why am I not getting a sign? So it's, it, it's all in your perspective and a matter of being open to it and, and allowing yeah. yourself to feel it. It's, it's interesting stuff. We could probably talk about that for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for, for sharing that with us, um, especially since it's so close to you. Yeah. So we appreciate that. So switching gears a little bit. Could you talk to us a little bit about maybe some of the routines and practices that you follow that contribute to maintaining your positive mindset? Yeah, of course. You know, I think for me, I think for me, probably the biggest ones are one is like your diet. And, you know, I have very strong feelings about this because I feel like personally uh, diet just kind of gets shoved in the same category as like diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. And obviously it depends on what your goals are. But to me, food doesn't really have to do about like your weight. I, a lot of people kind of in our society just view it that way of like, hey, if I eat this food, then I'll gain a lot of weight. But then if I don't, then I won't gain weight. Mm -hmm. That's like the old model of thinking that I used to have. And the reality is, is that you know, I talk a lot about mental health. I break a lot of this stuff down in my book. But when it comes to mental health, there are a lot of key sort of underlying mechanisms in our body that control our mental health. One of them is the capacity and function of your neurotransmitters in your brain and in your body. And there are a lot of neurotransmitters, but one of them specifically that is just so important is called serotonin. And serotonin does a lot of things that controls your mood, controls your appetite, controls your sleep. And like my whole book is about social anxiety. So it actually turns out that serotonin controls how somebody functions in a social interaction, in a social group, which is crazy, which I didn't know. And it turns out that only 10% of serotonin is in your brain. Turns out 90 to 95% of serotonin is in this thing that is in this thing called your gut microbiome, which is this ecosystem of bacteria between your stomach and intestines. And so a lot of that is dictated by your dietary choices and then chronic stress. And so I talk a lot about food and diet from the perspective of like, how do you have a good brain? It's not necessarily just about the calories or the macronutrients. It has to do with like, what is actually uh, going on underneath the surface? That's probably number one. Definitely number two is, is meditation in the sense of like, there's a thousand, there's 10,000 different health benefits to meditation. I could oh, go yeah. on and talk about them. Yeah. But I think the main one for me is that, you know, similar to what you were saying before, Michelle, about silence, when you sit down and you meditate and you try to be in silence, it's like the craziest thing ever. Like you, yeah. you close your eyes and the next thing you know, your, your brain is just, do, 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 yeah. and it's like yeah. giving you like all like these crazy scenarios. And I'm like, 
wait, how is this inside of me? And it just goes to show you like why we want to be distracted all the time, whether it's a good distraction or a bad distraction. But I think the real power and why I meditate every day is because it's almost like I get to see this model happen in front of me. I get to see this sort of event unfold of like, my brain thinks that there's a problem and there's another problem, another issue, something that it thinks the whole world is going to end. Yeah. And then my thoughts come and go and then they're gone. And I'm like, wait, what was I even thinking about? Mm-hmm. So then like next time when I'm just throughout my day before I'm about to hop on a meeting during a meeting and then those same thoughts start to pop up, then I'm like, oh, wait, this already happened before. This is just like my brain trying to get me to believe this crazy thing yeah. when I know that my brain is basically like a, it's like a beach. It's a shoreline. We're like the waves are going to keep coming again, Mm -hmm. again, again, again. There's nothing that you can do to stop them. And so meditation almost gives me like this simulation and where I see the, the, the human faultiness of just my thinking of, I think the stat is like the average human has something around like 60,000 thoughts a right. day. Yeah. So yeah, th- those are the two big ones. Then probably the last one that I would say is just the power of like, like mini workouts in the sense of like, you know, I'm someone who never used to work out ever. And as I started to like go to the gym regularly, I would go to the gym for an hour in the morning and then I would just come back home and I'd just be on my computer <laughs> for the yeah. rest of the day. And like, of course, if you go to the gym, that's great and everything. And especially now, if you can go to the gym, I still can't. But, but the real power in it is like human beings were not meant to just move excessively for one hour and then sit down inside for the rest of the day. That's a good and point. one of the, yeah. yeah. And then like one of the critical pieces that I found that helps me a ton is like anxiety is physical. Some of it is mental, but most of anxiety is physical, which most people don't know. Mm. And so if you do something as simple as like between every hour or between every two hours, you do some sort of movement, whether that's just go for a walk or you do some push-ups or jumping jacks or something that you, you enjoy doing that's physical and that's moving, that really helps me connect. And like, I know for me, like I can almost solve every single one of my problems that my brain thinks is real just by going for a walk. And I come back and I'm like, wow, that really worked. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, these are different things that I use every day that really help me like at a foundational level. I love that. Yeah. Those are all really good suggestions. And they're things we talk about too. Yeah. Meditation. Yeah, definitely meditation, I think has probably been the biggest thing for me because I've been like, and Michelle's like this too, like overthinking, anxiety, all of that stuff. So Mm -hmm. now like, of course I still get anxiety, but now I know, oh, okay, well, if I just do like five minutes of meditation really quick, yeah, then I'll calm down. It yeah. It take a lot. Yeah. And then like you yeah. said, you're kind of like just sitting there in the stillness and then you open your eyes and you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I nice. feel so much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like- for sure. Yeah. Overthinking. I, uh, yeah. Overthinking is so interesting. I, I feel like, like now I, of course I still overthink. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I feel There's like, no getting away from it. I love yeah, that. No. You're like, well, um, I still overthink, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it's definitely like less t- to before. And I remember yeah. for me, like, I know especially people who have social anxiety, like when they're in a social interaction, all they do is overthink. And mm-hmm. all they do is in their heads. It's super interesting. I, now that you said that, I have a section in my book. It's called uh, The Subtle Art of Not Overthinking. Nice. And it comes from uh, it comes, yeah. Yeah, it okay. comes from a play. It comes from a play on uh, Mark Manson's "The Subtle Art of uh, Not, Not Giving, giving up, up," which yeah, <laughs> which I'm sure you guys know. But uh, basically, I talk about like this fact of like I don't know if you guys have ever struggled with this of like overthinking and social interactions. I do. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I learned that completely changed my life is is just the power of like going for it. And what I mean is like I remember, let's say there would be two people in front of me. And like, we're in a, we're in like a meeting or something and they would just come, they'd have a conversation with me and I'd be listening to their conversation. And then in my head, I'm like, wait, what am I supposed to say next? Like, what am I going to say now? What am I going to say now? What am I going to say now? Oh, and then I'll like come up with something and then I'll like try to like package up like this perfect sentence, this perfect idea. And then by the time I'm about to say that they've already moved on to like a different subject. And then my brain is like re-scrambling. One of the super important things that I learned is just is just to open your mouth and just to go for it. And that seems like way too overly simple, which it is. But 
I found that a lot of re- a lot of the reason why people don't do that is because when you actually dig deep down into it, it's actually because they don't trust themselves. Mm. And I remember for me when I was growing up, there were so many times where like I promised myself something, where I told myself I would do something and I wouldn't do it or I would do something that would like begin to degrade the relationship that I have with trust. And so what I learned is that if you do that like a ton of times all throughout your life, it's basically like a relationship that you have with your friend. You know, like if you make, if you make friends, if you make plans with a friend and you're like, Hey, Michelle, let's go to this cafe tomorrow at like two o'clock. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and Aaron, you go there and Michelle isn't there. So then you text her, you're like, Hey, Michelle, where are you at? And she's like, Hey, super sorry. Something came up. Are you free tomorrow? Same time tomorrow. You're like, okay, let's do it. Tomorrow you show up at the cafe same thing happens. Man. And then, you know, because you guys are dear friends, you, you pre, you're like, okay, this <laughs> kind of seems strange. I hope she's yeah. okay. Tomorrow, <laughs> let's do the same thing. Tomorrow, same thing, same exact thing happens. Oh, man. Now, Aaron, you're like, all right, I, I don't want to meet with this I'm Michelle yeah, anymore. Who <laughs> doesn't respect me. Um, and so like, that's the relationship you have with yourself. And so like, next time you call on yourself to say mm-hmm. something or do something at the right time, and you see yourself don't do that, it's because you've degraded that relationship with trust. Yeah. And so if you can be mindful of that and begin to work on that, like with your own relationship, that'll give you the courage to just be able to talk without actually thinking about it first. And so like, it seems super, super simple, but I'm, I know for me, someone who has social anxiety, someone who might be a little bit more introverted, yeah. super, super useful i don't know does that no, make sense no it's powerful like powerful analogy yeah michelle's the extroverted one i'm yeah. the introverted one and i do ha- suffer with social anxiety I'm better now obviously i'm a podcast but um definitely <laughs> struggled with it so exactly what you're saying it's funny you say that because i think i kind of like naturally started doing that at work like mm. three or four years ago and like in that situation i got a lot better but it was like i had to like just not even think about it. Just like action. Yeah. And like, yeah, I stuttered a couple of times and yeah, like it didn't come out exactly how I wanted, but like you said, I actually said something versus just like sitting in the meeting and and not saying anything. So I love that. That's awesome. That's a really good example that you gave. I think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to that. And I never thought about it like that. (laughs) Like your, your trust with yourself and you just keep like not showing up for yourself. Yeah. That's really Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting. And then like, and like, you, the more you do that, the more you just, and especially if you, because like the big issue is that, you know, for example, like I, I, I talk about this, this Harvard study that I mentioned in my book, and basically they followed people all throughout their lives who had social anxiety. And basically what they found out was that they, they have very, very few deep relationships and they're doing jobs that aren't really the jobs they want to do and then also if they are like very high performing jobs they have very very severe performance anxiety Mm. and that also leads to them having a a history or developing substance abuse and also socialist isolation which are both correlated uh, with suicide and so like for example a lot of people who are extremely capable extremely smart extremely intelligent have social anxiety And they think to themselves that they have no idea what they're talking about. And everyone else around them is way smarter. Mm -hmm. And that's because of every time they try to open their mouth, their like their brain just goes silent. You know, people who have social anxiety, your your mind, your thoughts will just start to race when you're about to say something and it'll go completely blank. And so a lot of people have like this performance anxiety that doesn't even have to do with like their actual skills but it just more or less has to do with the skills they have around like managing their social anxiety. And so that's massive because I, I know so many smart people that don't speak up that when they do speak up, they, you know, may stutter and that's totally fine, or they may not be able to get the complete idea out. And it's not because they don't know the idea or they don't know what they're talking about. It's because they have social anxiety. And so that's like a super important uh, thing to to mention just in front like in workplaces people that work mm-hmm. uh, or just really do anything because it's it can impact a lot of someone's life in many different aspects for sure yeah that's a good point 
So Mark, we know that a lot of thought leaders are readers, or at least we do audible. So maybe do audible, maybe yeah. you read, but we're wondering what have you been reading or is there a book that you can recommend for our listeners that you think will impact their lives? Oh man. It's um, <laughs> a loaded question. <laughs> also, yeah. you wrote a book and we're going to talk about that, yeah. but yes. <laughs> maybe you'll give us yes. another one. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm like looking at my audible category. <laughs> Um, I love it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, there's so many books out there. And there, and like, there were so many books that totally changed my life, but now I wouldn't necessarily like recommend them because I know they're just not good books, but I just kind of ex exposed myself to them first. Mm -hmm. One book that I've recently read that really changed my perspective on things is this, is, is a book by someone named Dr. Daniel Amen. And this guy, he's like one of the most famous neuroscientists in the world. Mm. He's like Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus's mental health doctor. Oh, um, oh wow. This you guy must is like, be he, skilled. He, <laughs> he's got to be I, I mean, I mean, he is skilled because the reality is like, for example, Justin Bieber, he went years being like in and out of rehab, yeah, depression, yeah. anxiety. And then it actually turns out that he actually had undiagnosed Lyme disease which oh, right. none of his doctors, nobody that. knew. Yeah. yeah. And it was like part of his documentary and he's actually, the yeah. doctor's in his documentary too. Mm. And like, they didn't know that until they like scanned his brain and they found wow. that out. And like, you can, I think one of the side effects of Lyme disease for a percentage is like having schizophrenic type side effects, like, which is crazy. Mm. But this guy wrote this book called The End of Mental Illness. And basically he talks about this fact of like, we need to change how we just completely view mental health and mental illness. Because when you say mental health, like, what does that actually mean? Are you talking about someone who, you know, for example, was maybe born with like down syndrome, mm -hmm. or are you talking about the average person experiencing anxiety? And so he like breaks it down like a very easy to read kind of way on how we should begin to remove the stigma. But then he actually goes into like, I think he breaks it down into like diff like 16 different factors of your life mm -hmm. that could be contributing towards. So it's like this like whole very, very complicated yet simple guide. And I've never seen anything like it. It's definitely not a book that I recommend reading on audible because it's very <laughs> like hard. There's like charts and stuff. Yeah. So like Not a book for audible, but I highly recommend that book totally changed the way that I think about just like yeah. our brain health in general. No, that's like interesting. That. We've never had anybody suggest a book like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting. And we always link the book um, in the show notes so people can find it. So you guys can look there if you want to go back. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for that recommendation. So talk to us a little bit about what your biggest passion is. Tell our readers about our readers, that. Our, yeah. listeners. our listeners. Our readers. You can read too. Hey, we have a blog yeah. You could, yeah. you could be one of our readers too. <laughs> Go to our website. <laughs> Honestly, I think for me, I, to be quite honest, like, I feel like whenever throughout my entire life, whenever someone asked me that question, I wouldn't really have an answer. And now I could, I feel like I could give you like several answers, but a quote that I saw that really changed my perspective around this is your passion is a vehicle for your purpose. And a lot of the times, like a vehicle will run its course, but then sometimes you have to get out of that vehicle and then get up and go to a different vehicle. And it's not because there's something wrong with you. It's just because that's just the way life goes. So I think right now, my passion definitely revolves around, I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I've like, got, I've like shifted over like just like the last couple of months, but like in March, when my book came out, Screw Being Shy, I would tell you that my number one passion is definitely uh, trying to help people in the form of writing, talking, I guess, speaking, you know, working, trying to help people understand their own mental health, specifically in the lens of social anxiety, because it's, it's, it's what I went through. Yeah. But now my passion is like slowly shifting. And now I'm just starting to understand the more holistic message and the holistic sort of foundation of mental health. And that is the fact that, you know, if you have like no money and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills next month, it's going to be very hard for you 
to have sane mental health. Like that's just the reality. And they've done studies that show people who are in financially stressed situations and they barely know when their bills, they barely know when they can pay their bills next. I think like their IQ is like 20 points lower and like overall, like just their level of thinking and just like an objective approach is just much, much lower. And I know for me, when I was growing up and I was poor, I remember the real time where I began to actually think about myself and my potential and a lot of like these bigger topics was probably after when I was like 16, once I had started a pretty successful business that was making me a decent amount of money. And so now my passion, especially with what's going on in terms of, you know, the whole COVID-19, which is just unveiling a lot of other problems in society. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with like finances, what people are doing for a living, how they're spending just like their waking hours, what they're doing to make a living. Now I've just been spending more time on trying to also get people that may have it in here to also get it out there. And like, what I mean by that is like, I remember for me when I started my journey in like 2015, 2016, my entire focus was like, okay, how do I rewire my brain? How do I change my psychology? How do I reframe the way, the way that my spirituality works, my physiology, which is still true to some degree today. But as I've realized is the more I've been able to work on my inner internal world, the more I've been able to create success on my outside and my external world. Of course, those two are not 100% of the time correlated, Mm -hmm. but I just want to help more people do that. And so like, I have my book, Screw Being Shy. I'm still waiting on it to get processed by Audible. So the audiobook is coming soon. I came out with like a, a LinkedIn course, some things on like podcasting, just trying to do my best to just teach people like how the brain works, how they can manage their social anxiety, but then also like, how can they really like start a movement? Because I find that a lot of people that come to me and, and eventually become my clients are like introverts, but they're leaders. And they're mm-hmm. like, how do I scale my voice? How do I yeah. start this movement? Like all the stuff that I know in here, or like all the stuff that I talk about with my family or on my team, but how do I do that on the outside world? And so it's kind of like both of those pieces now, those two are my passion, but I'm sure if I come back on this podcast, like a year from now, I'm sure it'll change like, or shift a little bit. Yeah. That's natural. I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's, it's probably good for people to hear. Like, it's not like you're going to do something for 30 years yeah. and it's never going to change. And it shows growth, right? It shows that you're growing, you're evolving and you're helping other people do that too. That's a good thing. So let's talk about your podcast. So you're on a podcast with us right now, but you have your own podcast. And I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say yours is a little bit more popular than ours. That's fine. (laughs) But (laughs) one day we'll be in the top 100 with you. But your podcast is Human 2.0. So you interview some of the most like inspiring and innovative people. So tell us lessons you've learned from interviewing and maybe a funny story or something impactful, something about your podcast? Yeah. I mean, just one lesson that comes right off the cuff is I recently interviewed a lady by the name of uh, Janice Bryant Hoyward. And she is the first African-American woman to start and own a billion dollar business. Mm. And I remember when she inter- we were interviewing, when I was interviewing her, this was like maybe about two months ago and, uh, you know, COVID was going on, uh, not so much was going on like the last couple of weeks, but I remember she told me this thing and she said that, you know, every, there's not every time in history is going to be filled with, with like amazingness, mm-hmm. but every time there's always some ray of sunshine. And the example she gave me is really, really powerful. And I don't think it's ever going to leave me. She said, you know, as an African-American, I know that when the slaves were singing, it wasn't because they were happy. They were singing because they were trying to find hope, faith, just raw potential in who they were as human beings. And they were doing that to get by and survive and to Mm -hmm. pass like their soul in their mind. And so that is one lesson for sure of just like everyone knows, especially like in the positive 
mindset industry of like, yeah, there's always good times and bad times. Yeah. But I feel like that example, that quote really just made me be like, oh, wow, that makes a, a lot of sense. That's one. Another one is, you know, I don't necessarily think I've learned this from one episode. I think I've just learned this from just doing my podcast in general. But I remember like when I was starting off and then eventually as my podcast was getting more well-known and I was interviewing more well-known people, I remember I would go on like these chats or if it was in person, I remember I would meet them and I was so nervous. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm about to meet like this billionaire or I'm about to meet like this, this person or like whatever, who has like a million followers on Instagram. And through doing that time and time and time and time and time again, I've just really realized that they're all human and like they all experience moments of anxiety, being tired, maybe being a little bit depressed, maybe being confused, not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that really taught me the power of like, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't falsely idolize anyone. You know, it's fine yes. to look up to someone as a role model. But the reality is, is when you put someone up on a pedestal and you say, this person is so awesome and like they're superhuman and they don't have these problems that I do. What happens is you, that gives like permission to your, to your, to your mind to just be like, okay, there's no way I could ever be like them ever. Right. Like all the good things they have, all the successes, achievements they've had, there's no way I could do anything close to that because they don't have the same problems that I do. And they, they may very well have different problems, Yeah. but the yeah. reality is that all humans go through problems. And for me, like what that's given me the ability to do has been insanely grateful because now like, if I want to go start something or do something, I have, I know like 10, 15 people of that exact example who have yeah. done it. And right. some of those people, not all of them have become my friends, but a lot of my guests have become friends, clients, business partners, mm -hmm. collaborated on so many different things. And so just seeing that myself has given me the ability. The last thing that I want to say is, you know, I remember also when I was interviewing a lot of these well-known people, again, just to throw some like titles out there, mm -hmm. you know, billionaires, uh, world leaders, top selling authors, just a, a lot of uh, influential people that a lot of people know. I remember I would always be in the mindset of like, okay, they're doing me a favor. There's nothing that I could possibly give to that person. Mm -hmm. yes. And one of the experiences that really changed how I thought about that was I remember interviewing this New York Times bestselling author and we had like the, just like this chat. We booked it at like seven o'clock at night because that was the only time he could do it. And it was virtually. And I remember it was like a totally normal interview. And, uh, you know, my podcast is really or is try to focus on mental health. And so like about halfway in the interview, I started asking him about similar questions about mental health and just like about his life and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was this moment where like, he just like stopped answering and he began to tell me and he literally started crying and he was telling me that like three months ago, his brother had just committed suicide. Oh my gosh. And, he, and we kind of like stopped the interview for like five minutes and I'm telling him like, like, Hey, and like, like, you know, this is not a live show, like happy to reschedule, happy to not even do this interview if you don't want to mm -hmm. let me know. And he's like, no, no, just give me five minutes. And so it was just kind of like five moments of five minutes of silence. And then we just like had like a very candid, open conversation. And I feel like it was one of the best interviews I had ever done because it was, it was just super raw and real. Yeah. And I remember after that, it was just like, you know, that's it. I kind of sent him like a thank you email. And then I think it was maybe about like three months later. I just get a text from this guy. I got a call from him and he says, you know, Hey Mark, you know, I really wanted to thank you for that podcast interview because I was going through a lot at that time. My mind was in complete darkness and gutter. And I remember after I left that conversation, I felt like there was just a massive weight that was lifted off my shoulders and you really gave me room to process and to digest what I was going through. And he basically ended up inviting me to be a speaker at his event that literally had like 10, 15 other, like extremely other well-known influential people, 
mm-hmm. that like completely changed like my like status and like the whole influential industry game, whatever you want to talk about it. Yeah. And so like after that, I really realized like, oh wait, just because you, you're not on the same level as people in terms of maybe money or influence, mm-hmm. if they're a human, there's still something that you can give back to them. So that for me has changed my life forever. And I'm never going to fall into a podcast interview or just meet someone from like a different lens of I can't help them again. So yeah, yeah. that was super powerful. Oh, that is powerful. That is so cool. I feel what like you're talking story. directly to us <laughs> right? with everything that you just described. I mean, I guess because we do podcasts too, but so I feel like we've come across some of the same things, mostly when we, I mean, we haven't been doing this for that long since like last fall, but I remember when we were starting to interview and we mm-hmm. were, you know, our interviews were just with, you know, whoever we were connecting with. And then we got bigger interviews, bigger interviews, bigger interviews. And I think I'm just going to put it out there to be honest. We love Elena Cardone. Oh yeah. <laughs> and we had her on our podcast and it was one of those situations nice. where we're like, Yeah, okay, what if we say what are we gonna say to Elena? <laughs> like if we because when we first I will tell you this, okay, there's a lot of things I'm gonna tell you. I'll try to do it quick. <laughs> but we said when we first started podcasting, who is like a person like so far out of reach, we think we could never get, but we idolize and all of that, which now we are in the same mindset of you and rethinking idolizing people and so not that there's anything wrong with her but anyway but we were like in total on shock and we wanted Elena Cardone and that was going to be like when we knew we made it well (laughs) we had only been podcasting for like a couple months and then Elena agreed to be on our show and so we're like wait a second (laughs) first of all we need a new 10x right yeah but but it was amazing but I think in talking to her and how yes she was just a real person like very cool very Very easy to talk to yeah she me and we realized oh wait like we don't need to be so nervous these are just people and we've gone on to interview other like what people would consider successful high level people and but for us I think she was a real turning point in our podcasting not just because it was a goal of ours to have her on and we met that goal but also because we realized wait like the they're these are just regular people like you said and and we have something to offer them they have something to offer us yeah and we struggled with that too feeling like well we can't do what do we have to offer we're like no one compared to Elena Cardone but there but it's <laughs> you do, you have things to offer no matter what. So you were speaking directly to it. I don't know. I hope people listening are getting something, but we personally got something out of that. I can tell you. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. I I met, I met Elena at this event in Boston in 2018. Okay. You seem like a very nice person. I've yet to have her on my podcast though. And, and yeah, I mean, and like the reality is, is like five, 10 years later, people are also going to do that to you. You know, and so like you get to see this whole cycle, you know, go around and it's really just like people just just talking to people trying to like, just try to do their best, you know, in the day and try to help other people. And, and and yeah, I mean, I think that I, you know, I feel like once you become successful, I feel like the next thing you have to do is help other people become successful Yeah, because I like, agree. again, I'm, I'm like, of course you have to work on yourself every day. You got to like mm-hmm. do these things that we always talk about these routines and habits, but you know, sitting, sitting in like a room alone, just being successful is a very, very lonely and it's not oh, actually yeah. success. And right. so like, I feel that's like another part of my journey that I'm also on too of like, now that I have the success, where am I going to aim it towards? How can I make other people successful and, and bring them up with me? So yeah, yeah the that's cycle goes around. Yeah. I feel like we're we're the same way, even now. Like we see us as more successful as them. Maybe somebody just starting a podcast. They'll be like, wow, you're interviewing Mark Metry. How did you get to be so successful? (laughs) So they'll look at us. (laughs) They'll look at us, you know, above them. So really it's all relative, right? right? Because somebody who doesn't have a podcast would be like, wow, I don't even know how they have a podcast. It's amazing that they do that. We look at your podcast in the top 100 and we think, wow, what would it be like to have a podcast in the top 100? So really it's all just a perspective and, and relevant. And, see. and as you climb that ladder, like you said, it gives you purpose and meaning to help other people along their journey too. And I think Aaron and I are definitely into that. We, we try to do that as much as we can at whatever we're doing. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about your book. So, <laughs> so you just, you talked about it a little bit as we've been talking, but you just wrote a best-selling book called Screw Being Shy. How did you decide to write this book? And will readers learn when they read it? Yeah, so it's uh, it's called uh, Screw Being Shy. 
learn how to manage social anxiety and be yourself in front of anyone. And, you know, really, I wrote this book because I got the idea for this last year and I was in LA and this was the day before a speaking engagement. And I remember just like not being able to sleep that night because I like, for whatever reason, I was like kind of like in that half falling asleep, half like conscious reality. And I remember just like, screw being shy, screw being shy, just like kept popping up in my head, like, like blinkers. I feel like I had very few like ideas like that, that happened, but that was one of them. And I think the main reason why I wrote it is because, you know, when I used to be a speaker (laughs) at events, um, (laughs) which I'm I'm glad Florida's opening up, but when I used to be a speaker, I remember, I remember just like after, you know, people would walk up to you and some people would want to like take pictures. Some people would ask you questions some people just ask you like very general questions like hey what's like the best advice for like an entrepreneur or something like that Mm -hmm. but then there would be people that would walk up to me who would probably not make eye contact with me who Mm -hmm. seemed like super super introverted very very shy maybe even have social anxiety and I could tell like it was a lot for them to walk up to me and ask me a question because they would be sweating and I could literally see like the younger version of myself and them. Yeah. And they would walk up to me and they'd be like, you know, hey, Mark, how did you how did you go from someone who had crippling social anxiety to be able to like speak about your life story on a stage in front of like a thousand people about like very, very deep topics without any hesitation? And I remember I kept on getting that same question every single city I went to. And last year I, last year I spoke at uh, every single major city in America for the most part. And I remember that was a very, very common theme. And so I was like, you know what? I know I'm going to do a lot of great things in this world from various industries and topics, but this specific one about social anxiety, about like this concept of being a shy person or maybe even being an introvert, this is a topic that needs to be addressed because from the outside, if you don't really deal with this, this can seem like quite a harmless issue in the fact of like, Oh, you know, so what you struggle with talking to people. Hey, just be more confident. Just speak up. (laughs) And the reality is, is like, if you, if you are an introvert, uh, which by the way, if you look at the psychology definition means someone who like the way that their brain works is they're predominantly more focused on their inner thoughts, emotions, feelings. They're more introspective. It doesn't really have anything to do with shyness or social anxiety, which a lot of people don't understand. Mm-hmm. So unless you are introverted, uh, like just normally introverted, but you're still a confident person and you struggle with extreme shyness and social anxiety, you know how debilitating this is because the reality is, is you learn about yourself as a human being through social interactions. That's how your self-esteem, that's how your psyche, your ego, your identity gets built. If you have social anxiety and those interactions are skewed because you have this scientific psychological disposition for your brain to act in a certain way, you're going to have an extremely low self-esteem. You are going to have nights where you stay up for like four hours rethinking and replaying every single social interaction that you had that day Mm -hmm. and what you could have said uh, differently versus what you regret saying because you were afraid. And so the reality is, is that social anxiety is the most common form of anxiety in America. And out of all of the other anxiety issues, it is the most correlated with substance abuse as well as social isolation, which I said before is both heavily correlated to suicide. And I remember personally for me, when I was at that moment where I had social anxiety, I struggled with substance abuse, I was socially isolating myself, then I almost killed myself. So I just like went through all those things. And when I saw the data of that, I was like, man, I really, really have to write a book about this because I have yet to see a book about shyness and social anxiety Mm -hmm that kind of speaks about it from this perspective that I personally went through for 10 years. And I feel like I had to find like my own solutions that I literally had to like scour the world for and interview like almost 300 people and figure things out. And then also look at like the scientific literature and see what could back it up. And so, yeah, this book that I wrote was really just my first book because I know I'm going to write a lot of other books, but it's, I basically wrote it for anyone who comes up to me 
who experiences social anxiety, extreme in, introversion, extreme shyness. They feel like in every single social interaction, they like want to say stuff, but yeah. their brain is like holding them back and they can never have a voice. Mm -hmm. And they want like a real way to climb out of this. That's not just like anecdotally based on my story, but is actually based on the science. I wanted to write this book to just hand to people and be like, hey, you have so much potential as a human being. Like, you know, people look at what I'm doing at a young age and like, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. I wouldn't be able to do it if I still had debilitating social anxiety. And so I kind of view, hopefully if someone acts on the things that I write about in this book as like an unlocker of their potential, because mm -hmm. social anxiety is extremely, I view it as a, as a meta problem that affects all, in, all industries, everyone mm -hmm. in every region, country in the world, because everyone who has social anxiety doesn't talk about it. It's an invisible issue. That's and like, true. even when you look at sort of the mainstream solutions for mental health, for like, if someone does get down that negative, deep, dark place, it's call the suicide hotline mm. or go see a doctor or a therapist, all of which are fine. However, if you have social anxiety and you are to that spot where you may do things that you wouldn't normally do, it's hard enough for the average human being who struggles with mental health to be able to call a doctor, call a therapist, call the suicide hotline. It is 10,000 times worse for someone who is in that state, who has poor mental health and also has social anxiety to call. And so, you know, every single year, 850,000 people commit suicide and like, who knows what their stories were? Who knows right. what they could have felt? And I almost fell down that route. And so mm -hmm. I really wanted to write this because I feel like this is very much this like invisible problem that affects mm -hmm. a lot of our society, that affects a lot of different people. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful. We are also obviously going to link that book in the show notes. Yes. And you guys, if you're listening and maybe social anxiety isn't you, you probably know someone that, that, that struggles yeah. with that. So you might want to pick up this book for them too. So think about the people that are around you because maybe like Mark just mentioned, they might not be in a position to help themselves, but you could offer this book to them to help them. So, so think about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And the last thing that I'd say is funny enough, I like after releasing this book, and it's, oh my God, it's in June now. Jeez. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy June. Whoa. <laughs> I, I've gotten so, many feed, so much feedback from people who have read my book who don't have social anxiety. And they're like, this is an extremely good book. And I've had like entrepreneurs, like, for example, like David Meltzer and a lot of other people endorse my book and say that this is also a good blueprint for the average entrepreneur who has stuff and like stuff to do in their lives, but mm -hmm. also want to make sure they take care of their mental health. Right. Uh, it's also a good blueprint. So I was like very flattered by that. So yeah, even if you don't have social anxiety, you should check it out. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, good, good plug. Buy my book. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there's a million and there's more <laughs> reasons to buy the book. <laughs> yeah. So we like to end every episode with a segment that we call instant impact. So Obviously, we give advice in our guests, give advice throughout the whole show, but we believe small changes add up to big impacts. So maybe it's a little overwhelming for people to think about the overall of the episode, but if there was one small change that someone could make this week for a big impact in their life, what do you think it would be? Yeah, I think the biggest impact someone could make is if they stopped lying and started telling the truth. Oh. In the sense of, you know, going back to like the beginning of this conversation when I was talking about like your true self mm -hmm. versus what you learn and then all that stuff gets stacked on top. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of us go through events that we don't really have control over, but I found personally in my own life, there were so many times where I lied to other people and I lied to myself. And now everything that I know now that severs the relationship with who you are and the truth. And to give you an example, it's like this. Let's say you're a little kid and you have a rule in your house. That's like no cookies before <laughs> dinner time, no desserts. And obviously you're a little kid. And so you're like, I'm going to get that cookie. And so <laughs> yeah. you like, you like climb on top of, of the fridge, you reach into the cookie jar, you grab a cookie and you're like destroying it devouring it 
and then you hear your mom coming downstairs and your mom comes downstairs and then obviously you know moms have like superhuman ability so she obviously knows that you ate the cookie um <laughs> my son would love but, the story <laughs> <laughs> but like your son or, or whoever or whatever yeah. kid obviously you love your mom and you don't want your mom to be upset at you right and so you're like no mom i i didn't eat that cookie and so like this is a very very simple example to highlight what really goes on mm. ever since we are kids Whenever you lie to somebody else, you are actually creating a reality where you value that other person's opinion over your own opinion. And every time you create that reality, you basically take the real true version of yourself that you were born with and you shove him or her to the back of your life and you create this fake version of yourself and you put that to the front you do that so many times in so many different scenarios that are probably a little bit less innocent than eating a cookie. <laughs> mm -hmm. And next thing you know, you have no motivation. You have no idea who you are. And a lot of that has to do with you're not actually living your true real life because you are so disassociated from your life because you are constantly putting up these fake projections of yourself. The other side to this too is lying to yourself. An example of this is, for example, you, you're in a classroom, you, you're a teenager, you're in high school, you're in a classroom and you're, you're in a history class and the teacher's like, hey guys, does anyone know when, when World War I started? And I actually don't even, I think it was like 1940, I have no idea. Let's say it was yeah, 1940. Like <laughs> um, so let's say you were like watching a documentary last night about World War I by chance and you're like, okay, I know what happened in 1914. And as like you're about to raise your hand, you have other thoughts in your brain that are like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. is it really 1914? Because I'm pretty sure you have, you have a bad memory. You don't even remember what you saw last night. Or wait, are you actually sure? Because if you speak up, then, you know, maybe other people will think you're wrong and they'll make fun of you or whatever scenarios we have in our head. And so you will lie to yourself, even though you know the answer to not speak up, to not do the thing that is right in that scenario and you will do the same exact thing you'll take the real you that was trying to give you that answer you'll take him or her you'll shove it to the back and that fake you the one that is confused the one that thinks you're stupid that comes out to the front mm -hmm. and so you do this so 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 often next thing you know people are pushing themselves in extreme situations to feel something in the sense of like you start doing drugs, you start doing alcohol, you start stealing things because you are trying to feel an extreme, extreme emotion to actually feel yourself because you're desensitized and you're disassociated. Mm -hmm. And so a very simple habit of just telling the truth in every single scenario and not lying to yourself, not lying to other people, even if it sucks in the moment <laughs> yeah. is like a micro habit behavior that I try to bring with me and every single thing that I talk about, because I know it's going to bite me later mm -hmm. in the butt. So tell the truth. Don't lie. Extremely yeah. viable. Oh, I like it. Good advice. Yeah, that's awesome. Simple, not easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we talk about that a lot. Things are simple, but not necessarily easy. <laughs> yeah. So Mark, if people want to find you and learn more about you, where can they go? Yeah, so... They can just go to my website, just my first and last name dot com, Mark Metry, okay. M A R K M E T R Y dot com. Obviously, I have like the podcast link, book link, social media. My email is there. I have my business phone number. People are free to text me even. Oh, so yeah, cool. yeah, that's where people will go. And and yeah, I appreciate you guys for having this. I, I can't even believe it's 312. <laughs> I know, we were, we were just like, it's like having a regular conversation. Sometimes you just forget that you're, you're podcasting. It was a really great conversation. We appreciate you yeah. taking this much time to, to talk to us. And I know that our listeners are going to get a lot of value out of it. Absolutely. Of course, that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. You guys are awesome. You guys are great hosts. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All right.